This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Thank you. So we got lucky today. I was just telling Ben, outside my house, the ice cream truck comes around with that crazy electronic, I don't know what kind of music, some song they keep playing on this loop, and it's right in front of my house. So they just pulled away, so we're not going to get interrupted by that. And on your side, you got some construction going on or something. Yeah, well, there's some electrical work being done in my garage right now to finish up our new uh, kitchen setup. So we're not so lucky on that end, but our, our microphones are pretty good, so I think we'll be okay. So I was just on a call with a couple of our colleagues, Matt and Ben, with our friends at Wealthstream in New York City, our good friends down there. And on the call, on the Zoom call, they all had their, uh, or three of them had their, Rush Reminder shirts on. So we're all in uniform almost. <laughs> so it's actually kind of neat to know that the number of advisors I was thinking that reach out to us from all over the world. Like last week I, I was connected, it got connected to someone in Australia, which is super cool to hear what they're up to and the impact of the podcast. And, and it's just great to hear from people. So if you did want to connect, please do reach out. Definitely. Um, the summer sale ends today. <laughs> This crazy rational summer sale, unbelievable number of orders came in. Today being today that we're recording or today on the release of the episode? No, today of the release, the 29th. So we're recording okay. the 26th, but I know you're getting on Thursday the 29th for those who are keen to listen to it on the Thursday. So two weeks sale, and wow. I mean, for us, it was, it was a lot. So kind of neat. And we unfortunately ran out of socks. They're back in stock now. So any orders going forward, get the free socks. They're in. I was talking to Angelica the other day. Maybe maybe she can set up something in the community board about some ideas for Christmas. If people have ideas for merchandise for the Christmas season. Oh, like let us special know. Christmas merch? Yeah, like if people wanted Christmas merch. She thought of maybe a, a, a or she did or I did a Christmas ornament perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's a little too nerdy. I don't know. So if you have ideas, drop us a note. We had a thread at one point in the community for merch ideas, and there was a bunch of neat ideas that came out of that. I have to go back and check that out. Had some very nice reviews lately. One was from Funnier. Uh, the analysis and research is often challenging. It drives me to learn more and keep developing my own intelligence and rational development. Keep up the great work. Very nice to hear. Also from Johnny F123, with all the hype out there these days, you guys are keeping it real for the rest of us. The third one from Patrick D, which we talked about two weeks ago. Remember we talked about the guy who yeah, yeah. gave us a, a three star? <laughs> the, their number one finance <laughs> podcast and we got three stars. So he did say, he dropped us a note back saying, my top number one finance podcast by far. I love the academic approach to investing. It really feels like you want to help and inform the audience. Greetings from Sweden. An edit though, he said, I never said it was my top number one podcast overall. This would explain the three. Ha ha. Now, of course, your podcast deserves five stars. I laughed so hard when I heard you talk about my review. So pretty good again. So maybe he's laughing again. We'll see. Upcoming guest next week, Katie Milkman. And then two weeks after that is fixed income manager Dave Plecka from Dimensional Funds. And then two weeks after that is Gordon Erlam, someone you discovered. Great interview. Well, the, the, the Rational Reminder community discovered Gordon Erlam and... Uh, Pointed True. people in the community to a bunch of his research, and then I, I reached out to him probably almost a year ago now, and he agreed to come on. Awesome, it's a great interview. Uh, coming up in the community, Larry Suero is going to be in the community on August 18th, Wednesday at noon Eastern. Yeah, we've got a good flow of questions coming in from the community for things that they would like to hear us talk to Larry about. So if you if you have ideas for, for that conversation, let us know. And the format will be similar to last time where it'll be us speaking with Larry live. Uh, but if, if we have lots of good questions from the audience beforehand, then that'll help us uh, have a good productive discussion that's that's going to be interesting for everybody. So it will be like the Wes Gray interview. Which yeah, same, same format. A little bit more casual than a podcast recording, but yeah, same idea. So that Wes Gray, by the way, is up on the YouTube channel now. And then on Wednesday, September 15th at 3 Eastern, Jack Vogel will be joining us. Yeah, and for Jack, he said that he had some some good ideas that he thought the community, knowing how sort of geeky and, and factor-focused the community is, 
uh, that he had some really good ideas that, that he thought would be interesting. So we're waiting for him to give us those and then we'll post those in the, in the thread for him and hopefully get a good discussion started for, uh, to pr- for, for us to prepare for that conversation with him. And today we're restarting listener questions. I don't know why we stopped doing them. I think we just forgot. Well, we, we talked about this a while ago. We, <laughs> we created the community. So all the listener questions would happen there. And I would often chime in and participate in those discussions. But that kind of, <laughs> because all the discussion was there, instead of individual emails coming to me, we kind of stopped talking about it on the podcast. Yeah. But we wanted to start it again. So we started, a, Angelica started a thread in the community to get, to, to source listener questions. We already have a bunch of good ones. We're going to talk about one today. But the, the hope is to do at least one listener question per episode going forward. So again, if you have a listener question, you can send it to us by uh, email if you like, or go into the community in that thread that Angelica has created for listener questions and stick it in there and we'll, uh, we'll select one each week. Cool. Or each, each alternating week, I guess. Cool. Anything else? No, that's good. Welcome to episode 160 of the Rational Reminder Podcast. So getting lots of book recommendations coming directly to me. Maybe you're getting them also, but it's it's great no, to hear. No, I'm not. People you're not. know that I don't read the books. Well, you read enough other books. Anyways, so I, I appreciate it very much. I, I don't always have enough time to read them all, but I do take note of them and we'll uh, uh, hopefully talk about some going forward. There's some really good books ideas coming through. Anyways, this week's book is The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. So uh, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, I'm into learning about strategy, business strategy of late. And after having read Playing to Win, which I loved, my Kindle came up and recommended The Infinite Game. And so Simon Sinek also wrote the book Start With Why, which we reviewed back in episode 121. I think most people know who Simon Sinek is. They've probably seen his Start With Why TED Talk or, or on YouTube. Anyways, this book is, I thought it was phenomenal. I went after and read some of the reviews in Goodreads. Reviews weren't that great. That's Hmm. okay. Uh, I really liked it. It was, I think, really compelling and engaging to me because it talked about the way we think about our business, which is kind of this infinite, infinite, at least a hundred year time frame. We don't view our own practice as short-term wins. We view it about long-term relationships, multi-generational money, and we don't, we view the world as there's enough business business to go around for everybody, which is why we love helping this community and believe that, you know, good things always come and come back and help you out. And he's quite emphatic that business is not something to win per se. And this is very much at odds with the book Playing to Win, which is all about the drive to win. And that is not Simon Sinek's thing at all. And he compares it to, um, if you compare business to a game, so a game has finite rules, finite um, scoring, finite amount of time. At the end of that time, whoever wins, wins. And he says in business, there's really no fixed rules. There's certain laws you have to follow, of course, and, and, and ethics. But the, the rules change. Businesses evolve. Customers evolve. The marketplace evolves. And different companies also have different objectives. You may want to give back to the community more. You may want to have a higher profit margin. You may want to go public. You may want to be bought out. Everyone has their own personal objectives. Therefore, everyone's own rules are different. Therefore, he thinks that viewing it as winning is is not the ideal way to look at it. So again, it is very much in conflict with playing to win. So I'm, I'm trying to reconcile that. But he says, you know, the benefit of, of the infinite game is that your focus becomes much longer term Think about multi-generational, think about the next generation of successors in, in your business and being resilient long-term. So he highlights that to build a strong, resilient company, you need to be advancing a just cause. So this is what's important to the people in the business. Like what is your real, your mission and your purpose? Then you build a trusting team around that. You of course study other people in the marketplace so that you're ready to pivot if the need be to compete and he said you have to be courageous enough to lead that business towards towards that just cause so i i I really enjoyed the book i i I think it very much speaks to how we think about how we look at our practice it's great i love getting your insights about these books because then i don't have to read them (laughs) 
See, and you, you, you do time. a good job. You, you do a good job distilling them. I, I, I don't even say that jokingly. I read a tweet this morning. Someone said, if you don't remember the book you read, did you really read it? So I've started to come up with books. Like when it's in the Kindle, they're all there, right? So I think there's going to be a bunch of books I'm going to kind of put on repeat because they, they do kind of melt away. I think every book has an impact, but they do start to kind of melt away in the background. Shane Parrish has a, had a blog post. I'm sure he still has it on, on the Farmer Street blog about how to read a book. And if I remember correctly, one of the big takeaways was that you read the book and then you put it down for a week and then you read it again because the second time you come back to it, you're a different person because you've started to integrate some of the information from the book. And the second time you read it, it's that much more impactful. I remember saying a long time ago, and I don't know who to attribute it to, but you only change based on the people you meet and the books you read. Hmm. There you go. In recent news, Vanguard is moving into direct indexing. I thought that was a pretty big story this week, especially given the topics that we talked about two weeks ago and also your main topic today. Um, but th the story that I came across in Financial Planning Magazine is that Vanguard has just acquired Just Invest, which is a provider of direct indexing versus, uh, via separately managed accounts, and they manage about a billion dollars right now. And Vanguard, of course, is trillions of dollars, four trillion, five trillion or something. So you can only imagine where this might go. And the other personal advice service so the author of the article is wondering if, you know, if direct indexing could be a complementary service inside that package. Again, you can only imagine where, where this could go. Um, and and it's it also go, been, go ahead. It'll, it'll go wherever the proponents want to push it. I mean, we have obviously Vanguard entering the mix here. Um, O'Shaughnessy launched the Canvas product. I'm sure there are others there and there have been others that, that, um, came before before those two as well but it's i mean you have it right here the fees are currently 40 basis points if vanguard drives the fees to 10 basis points hey you know what as a business that's still uh twice as much revenue as they're getting from a, a DTI. spider yeah yeah exactly and i and it, it who knows I, I i can't speak to what vanguard's strategy is going to be but if they really push it down to 10 10 basis points good for them uh, but the 40 basis points that's the fee level that i've seen most other separately managed account offerings and fintwit lately had so many tweets about this is the future of investing direct indexing and i get the appeal from the consumers and i guess from perceived value added by advisors but it's almost like you can make the argument this is basically active management in a new wrapper well all you have to get is what you just said it can be sold people will buy it that sounds like a pretty good, pretty good business proposition to me. Consumers may, may want it or think that they want it, and, and it becomes a part of the reason that an, an advisor can charge a fee. I don't think it's a very strong value proposition. And loss harvesting always comes up in the context of yep. separately managed accounts or of, uh, of direct indexing. There's the customization piece and there's the loss, harvest, loss harvesting piece. And I'm not really convinced of, of either in, in terms of real benefits yeah. to the client. And the author agreed with you on the, uh, the tax loss harvesting. He says it's just a deferral and basically gave quick points to your point from two weeks ago. So you want to talk about something new from CIBC? Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. So people may be familiar with American Depository Receipts, ADRs, which are instruments that allow American investors to trade foreign securities on American exchanges. So kind of a neat little financial product that's been around for a long time. I don't know when ADRs uh, started trading, but they've been around for um, as, as long as I've been in this world in financial services. I don't know. Do you know, Cameron, when ADRs started trading? It could be as long as you've been in this world, period. Yeah, okay. So yeah, they've been <laughs> around for guessing. a long time. And uh, C Canada has not had a similar product, but CIBC is launching... Uh, some Canadian depository receipts, CDRs. Doesn't sound quite as catchy. Maybe it has to. Maybe it needs some time. A ADR sounds so, sounds so good. Anyway, so C CDRs are going to start trading. Uh, from the article I read, it looks like they're starting with one CDR for Amazon. So what this means is that a, a, as a Canadian investor on the Neo Exchange, you can buy a uh, CDR 
that gives you exposure to the Canadian uh, dollar hedged price movements of Amazon and they trade in units of $20. So instead <laughs> of doing an FX and, uh, and, and paying $3,600 at the time this article was written, US for a share of Amazon, you can stay in Canadian dollars and a purchase a $20 unit of the, depo- of the depository receipt uh, currency hedged, which I mean, I'm, I'm not crazy about that, but I guess if you're speculating on the stock, maybe you want the right. currency to be out of it. So I can I can see that you don't want to speculate on the currency uh, in that situation. Uh, there, there was uh, I didn't have it in my notes, but there there were some not insignificant fees in there for for creating the product. I don't know if you caught those, Cameron. No, I did not. Yeah, it was uh, some something that caught my eye. I just didn't end up taking a note of what it was. Oh, here we go. So the the spread, they earn small fees from foreign exchange transactions that it makes in the background to manage the currency hedge for investors. The maximum spread rates that CIBC can collect from those transactions is capped at 60 basis points on an annualized basis. So that's part of the part of the profit that CIBC, CIBC expects to make. But either way, I mean, I think it's a pretty neat little financial innovation and could be the start of something interesting for Canadian investors, not that I'm promoting investing in, in individual stocks, but I think the the more mature our financial market gets, the better it is for all for all Canadians. So that's it. I thought this was a uh, just an interesting story, and it'll be neat to see what what comes and whether what other financial institutions get uh, get in on it. Good perspective. All right, listener question. Yeah. So as we mentioned in the introduction, our our plan is to get back into doing listener questions each episode and this one was uh more than a question it was a whole bunch of questions (laughs) it was from uh spreadsheets who if anybody is active in the in the rational minor community they'll recognize who that is he's one of the most prolific posters in the community he makes lots of great contributions and he's recently done a bunch of uh analysis on adding bonds to a portfolio of stocks for an early retiree and so he sent me some questions in, in the community and asked if I would answer them. And I said that I would do it on a podcast. So I did that. And we'll talk about it. The other thing that I did to answer these questions is I talked to Ray, who works with me in, in our PWL research team. And Ray brings to this discussion specifically because it's about bonds. Uh, Ray brings some some really unique insight because in his former life, he was an institutional fixed income portfolio manager. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he knows bonds uh, better than better than most people. Although, a, a, as a separate note on that, we do have Dave Pleka, uh, Dimensional's global head of fixed income, coming up on the podcast pretty soon. And there was a lot of overlap between the questions that we're asking Dave and spreadsheets questions. So ho- hopefully, my answers here match up somewhat with, uh, <laughs> with Dave. <Pleka's. laughs> but I think, as as far as bond knowledge goes, uh, I said Ray knows more than most people. I would venture to say that Dave Pleka knows more than uh, maybe maybe more than anybody, <laughs> more, more than most at least. It's a pretty good lineup, uh, though, to answer spreadsheets questions. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Okay, so to kick it off, spreadsheet says I think a small allocation to bonds for an early retirement can add value in the worst case event. I have I have decided to allocate roughly ten percent to bonds, which I will phase away after I reach a level of spending that is more than enough. Uh, okay. So starting the questions, the purpose of bonds would be to help provide liquidity in a worst case scenario. Based on this, would you use treasuries or stick to something like Zag as you have in the model portfolio? Uh, based on these tables, which we can show in the YouTube video, uh, some heat, heat map type tables that spreadsheets made, um, I do not see the benefit of adding corporates. And he's showing the performance of different securities, of, of stocks, uh, different types of bonds in crisis scenarios and how they performed. And corporates didn't do so great relative to government bonds and treasuries. So, oh, I didn't mention. So I talked to Ray about this. Uh, I'm gonna give you what Ray said uh, and then I'll give my my take. Uh, so Ray told me that if, if liquidity is the objective, and that's a key here, if liquidity is the objective, there's nothing better than federal government bonds. Uh, Ray thinks that Zag and treasuries are not directly comparable because they're not denominated in the same currency, which is another point that we're gonna talk about as we go through these questions. 
Uh, so Ray suggests for this purpose specifically, if, if liquidity is the objective, then you've got to own short-term federal government bonds um, in a currency that matches your expenses. So pretty, pretty sensible answer there. Uh, my take on this is that if, if we're defining liquidity as the primary objective of the bond allocation, we're heavily constrained in, in answering the question to the most liquid assets, which are going to be cash or other short-term government debt obligations. Uh, if we expanded the question, which is probably what I would suggest doing, uh, to ask whether corporate bonds have a place in a portfolio at all, I think that they do, as there is there there's a documented uh, credit risk premium, which we've talked about uh, yep. a fair amount on the podcast. Uh, I also think it's important to note that there are an infinite number of combinations of risky assets uh, to suit the needs of every investor. Uh, you can take on less credit risk and more equity risk. That's fine. That can be a good portfolio. You can take on less equity risk and more credit credit risk and arrive at a somewhat similar risk profile. I think that can also make sense. So I don't think there's a single right answer here. But in, in the question that Spreadsheets is asking, I want liquidity in a crisis situation. You have to pick the most liquid assets, which you're, you're then excluding corporate bonds from from that. But I, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with the premise of the question, I guess, is what I'm saying there. Uh, the next part of the question. Also based on these tables, I think using intermediate term treasuries, something around 10 years, seems appropriate considering that long term treasuries and short term treasuries are both helpful during equity crashes at different times and an intermediate treasury seems like a rough average of the two. Would you agree? Ray said a mix of short and long bonds have more convexity and are likely to outperform a bullet intermediate treasury bond of the same duration in a crisis situation. This said, unless you have $100 million plus to manage, I would not overthink this decision. Good insight there. Now I'm going to explain what a, a little bit about convexity and I'm going to explain uh, what Ray meant when he said a bullet portfolio. Uh, so two, two bond portfolios can have the same duration, but they can be structured differently in terms of their expected response to changes in the yield curve. And that's called convexity. Uh, the, the two main strategies, if you pick up like a CFA textbook, the two main strategies for dealing with uh, expected changes in the yield curve. So if you're an active bond portfolio manager are using uh, bullet and barbell portfolios because they respond differently depending on the type of change that you're anticipating. Uh, a, a bullet portfolio is concentrated in securities of the same duration as the portfolio's target duration. While the barbell portfolio is concentrated at the shorter and longer ends of the maturity spectrum to give you an average duration that matches the portfolio's target duration. Right. So you've got two portfolios of the same duration, but the barbell portfolio is going to have more convexity. The implication of that is that if the yield curve flattens, the higher convexity is going to boost the performance of the barbell portfolio over the bullet portfolio. So that's a, a, a flattening yield curve. Um, and if you think about it, if the yield curve flattens, you've got short rates rising, um, but short-term debt instruments aren't really going to change in price if a short rate rises. Long rates fall. Uh, bo long bonds get a price boost because they're more price sensitive to changes in rates. Yep. So if you've got a barbell portfolio, this is good because you're insulated on the short end and you get a boost from the, from the long end, insulated on the short end because the prices just don't change much. But if you've got a bullet portfolio, you don't really get the boost on the long end. Uh, and it's kind of similar if there's a parallel downward shift in the yield curve, because again, the short prices don't change much. Long prices change more than intermediate. So if you're in a bullet portfolio um, or, or a barbell portfolio, the higher convexity is helpful with a, in a downward shift. Uh, if the yield curve steepens with short and intermediate, uh, with short and intermediate rates falling and long rates remaining unchanged, then the bullet portfolio outperforms. Right. So there's the one case where the bullet portfolio can outperform. Uh, but I think what's what's important as a takeaway for Spreadsheet's question here is that it's not obvious to say that one strategy is better than the other. They just have different responses to changes in the yield curve. And I think that to say that one is objectively better than the other for the purpose of providing liquidity in a crisis is also a prediction on how the yield curve is going to respond to that crisis scenario. And I don't know if we can make that prediction. We can look at the past and say, this is what the yield curve has historically done. But that doesn't tell us much about what's gonna happen in a future crisis. So which one is better for a spreadsheet's purpose? I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but, but I think what Ray, Ray's point was that uh, the convexity, g given what tends to happen in a crisis, the convexity would be helpful. But yeah, I, that's but the I'm premise saying, of why you're having it. It's for periods of crisis, you need liquidity. So that's the argument to take advantage of what the yield curve might do, as opposed to, no, just take the high road, give me the safe short-term stuff. But you take, you're taking both in this case, right? It's like we're taking, we're taking the mix of super short-term and long-term, right. or we're taking intermediate. But, but he could he could go all short though, and say there's price says I just want security, the objective is security. You That's could a go preference all short question, time. right? Yep. Yep. Uh, so the next part of the question: What do you think of buying an ETF with ten year Treasuries versus buying an ETF with a blend of all durations with an effective duration of ten years? So he's comparing the ETF GOVT uh, versus IEF. Um, uh, I think the, the question is very similar to what we just talked about. Uh, it's it's going to be back to convexity where uh, GOVT is, is not quite a barbell because it's holding the full spectrum of maturities, but it's closer to a barbell portfolio than IEF, which is definitely a bullet portfolio. So I don't really know how you, I don't know how you pick unless you're making a call on what the yield curve is, is going to do. In, in the short term, I mean, in, in the long run, maybe you take the one with the, with the higher yield. Um, I think Ray, Ray said he'd pick the one with the shorter duration. So it depends what you're trying to accomplish, though. I think for the, for the purpose of being the short-term hedge in a crisis, then you're going to want the shorter duration. But there are a lot of, <laughs> a lot, a lot of different ways to, to think about this and, and to answer the question. Uh, spreadsheets then asks, what do you think of Canadian treasury ETFs versus us? Uh, it seems that an ETF like ZFM, which focuses on Canadian treasuries, isn't diversified enough due to the availability of Canadian treasuries. It has 21 holdings and 135% turnover. Uh, Ray comes back to what he said earlier that it, it, it depends on the currency, uh, of, of your expenses. You, you don't really want to hold. It's basically like holding USD as a hedge against a crisis when your expenses are in Canadian dollars. Historically, that's probably worked out okay because Canadian dollar tends to depreciate against USD in a crisis. But again, we don't really know what's going to happen in a future crisis. So I think you kind of want to be denominated in your home in your home currency or, or have exposure in your home currency if, if, the goal is, if the goal is safety. Otherwise, you're taking on that currency volatility as well. Uh, I don't really think the number of, of issues held in the fund, like spreadsheets mentioned 21 holdings. With stocks, we worry about the number of holdings because skewness is an issue in stock returns. When we're talking about um, when we're talking about bonds, uh, government bonds, I'm not super worried about skewness. Like each, each issue is going to perform relatively yep. similarly. Yep. Uh, turnover is also not really an issue. Um, because the the trading costs for these securities are extremely low. So again, whereas that would be an issue with stocks, it's not so much of an issue in this type of bond portfolio. Um, yeah, so that's that's it there. Uh, and then the last question relates to uh, provincial bonds, uh, municip municipalities and, and agencies. And Ray had a really cool answer for this one, which is just a, you know, experience in the bond market type answer. He said, provincial and agencies are treated by markets as credits. They're less liquid in a stressed environment. If you're at risk of selling in the middle of a panic, then the government of Canada bonds are, are preferable. Um, yeah, so I thought that was all pretty interesting. Oh, and then one more question was, uh, is there any merit to leaning more towards short-term treasuries considering the low interest rate environment we're in? I think this speaks to your comment, Cameron. If the ultimate goal is is liquidity and safety, then I, I think going with anything other than short-term treasuries is a bet on a crisis response similar to the past, where intermediates maybe did really well in historical crises, but that doesn't mean they're going to be doing that. Doesn't mean they're going to do well in the future. I guess with short-term treasuries, the other side of that comment that I just made is that if the crisis is paired with high inflation. Well, no, you'd be better off in short-term treasuries in that case. That's the, the if, if the goal is liquidity sleeve, sleeve, it doesn't get better than short-term treasuries. And I think right. like the analysis that, that spreadsheets did, which was very interesting, I think a lot of it is, well, it's, it's historical analysis. A lot of it relies on how, how different uh, assets have performed in past crises. 
And I just don't know how much insight we can gain from that for structuring a, an optimal portfolio for for the future. Uh, and then spreadsheets ask which ETF specifically. I don't really f- want to make specific ETF recommendations on the podcast at the moment without doing a whole bunch more due diligence that I'm not actually going to do. So probably just won't <laughs> just won't go there for making a specific recommendation. Um, but he also asked uh, which so which ETF would you use or would you maybe still have corporate? So what what I wrote in my notes for that question is that I, I, in structuring my own portfolio, would not have fixed income for the sole purpose of providing a liquidity sleeve. Um, so I, I don't really know if, if if I can answer the question anyway. I, I think a liquidity sleeve implies a market timing decision because you're effectively increasing your exposure to equities after a crash by spending fixed income without rebalancing. And that's something that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I think it's a market timing decision. Um, so I, I, I don't, I'm not convinced that it's a, that it's a sensible approach. Um, if I were to add bonds to my portfolio, which I don't currently have, but if I were to add them, I would want to have the same kind of variable maturity, variable credit, globally diversified strategy that we talked about in our factor investing with fixed income episode. That is all for the listener question. It's a pretty good set of answers for our friend's spreadsheets. I think so. Hopefully we get some more insight from uh, Dave, Dave Pleka. He probably forgot more about bonds yesterday than I've I've learned so far in my career. <laughs> Dave's amazing. So on to the main topic. Day yeah, trading so I w- in 2020. I was uh, contacted by um, Global Global News to do an interview on on fractional shares at Well Simple. It was supposed to come out on this past weekend, but it hasn't come out yet. Apparently, it's going to come out soon. Anyway, so it got me thinking. It was a video interview. A video interview, yeah. And it'll, they're doing a written post about it. And it's going to be on their social media and whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it. But the, the questions that they were asking me, it was based on Wellsimple having fractional shares, uh, Wellsimple Trade having fractional shares now, which is a new development in Canada. So the questions were focused on on that and what it's going to do to the market and all this kind of stuff. But my, my answers were more about what it's going to do to individual investors and whether it's a good thing ultimately for for them. Uh, but then it got me thinking. Uh, I, my, my, I did a, my, a video on day trading in October of last year, which seems crazy. It feels like I just released that, but it's almost been, I guess, not quite a year. But it's com- coming up on that anyway. Time just, time just flies. So, it got me thinking that I should revisit my research on that, just because last year was such a crazy year, and I figured somebody must have looked at, you know, what what happened with day trading last year in, in a from from an academic perspective. So I started poking around and I found some, I found some pretty, some pretty good stuff. Um, a, a lot of the feedback that I got when I released that day trading video was that the papers that I was relying on to draw my conclusions were too old to be relevant in the you know modern modern day of of free trading and and uh, online access to information and all that kind of stuff. And it's true. A lot of those papers were old and even the papers that were newer, most of them, not all of them, but most of them still relied on data sets from like the early 2000s or even the late 90s in in some cases. I did have one paper there that was based on more recent data, but most of them were were older. And even the more recent one was like 2014. And that's like with how fast technology has been moving with respect to trading, that, that is a long time ago. It's a long time. Yeah, it really is. It's a thing that things have changed. Uh, a lot. So uh, in that video, the conclusions that I drew based on, I think I had six published academic papers, the, all these old, old papers. Um, and, and they showed that day trading is not profitable for, for most people. Uh, more frequent trading leads to higher likelihood of poor performance. Uh, individuals tend to focus their trades on attention grabbing stocks rather than rationally assessing the full global opportunity set. And Shocker. that increases the... What's that? Shocker. <laughs> yeah. And that, uh, that, that increases the, the likelihood of trailing the market given the intense skewness in, in stock returns that we, we often talk about. Um, now, last year and, and this year to an extent as well, stocks like GameStop and AMC have gone to the moon, uh, so to speak. And that, that made it seem like there was a lot of money to be made 
uh, with with but by joining in on this this action that that all of these app based free trading investors were uh, were getting in on. Uh, so that the everybody observed this happening, and just as I found it interesting, there were some academic researchers that also found it interesting. And Robinhood, I, I believe they've stopped now, but for a time. And I don't actually know if that's true. For, for a time, Robinhood had an API where you could access all of their anonymized trading data. Uh, and so there was a website called Robin Track, which was just pulling that data and downloading it, making it accessible to researchers. Wow. So there, there are people that took that data and, and examined it. How, how have Robinhood traders, traders done? Uh, so the first one I looked at, uh, Brad Barber and Terrence O'Dean, they're the guys that have authored a ton of the literature on, like in my last video on day trading, a uh, majority of the papers were written by those those guys. They've managed to get their hands on some crazy data sets. And we've learned from them so many of the behavioral finance issues that we know plague investors. We've learned that from the, the research that these guys have have done. Uh, one of their papers summarized all of their research findings and it said they said that uh, individual investors tend to underperform. They tend to sell their winners and hold on to their losers. And that's the, uh, what's that one called? The endowment effect? Is that what it is? Anyway, so m many of the behavioral biases that we are aware of come from this, this research. Uh, they're also heavily in influenced by attention grabbing stocks uh, and recent past performance and they hold undiversified stock portfolios. So that's individual investors in a nutshell based on Barbara and Odin's past research. They came out with a 2020 paper, uh, Attention-Induced Trading and Returns, Evidence from Robinhood Users, and them and two co-authors. They examined the Robin Track data that I mentioned, uh, which, which let them look at all, all of the trading from Robinhood users and, and just ask this question of how, how do they do. That is the endowment effect. I just looked it up. Yeah, okay. When you hold on to something longer that you own, you, you attribute more value to something you already own. Right. Uh, so Barbara and Ardeen and their co-authors in this paper, they suggest that attention-influenced investors are more likely to exhibit hurting behavior. Uh, so that's like they're, they're more likely to all do the same stuff at the same time. And you think about it, like one of the examples they give in the research is that the Robinhood app shows the top movers up and down um, of, of stocks for each day. And if everyone has the same information, then they're going to all do the same stuff if they're trading based on attention, yep. based on something that's catching their, their attention. So uh, they, they find that 35% of Robinhood users net buying activity is concentrated in only 10 stocks compared to 24% for the general population of retail investors, which I thought was still pretty high. Even that, exactly. I was blown yeah. away by that stat. <laughs> but a lot higher for Robinhood users. Um, and they find multiple herding episodes per day where the number of Robinhood users owning a particular stock increases dramatically. Uh, and, and the herding behavior is predicted, this is the interesting part, predicted by measures for attention, like recent investor interest, recent extreme returns, or unusual trading volume. Uh, so there, there does appear to be herding behavior going on within the, the Robinhood community. Uh, they, they also find that during Robinhood outages, so if the Robinhood app is down, uh, retail trading drops more in high attention stocks uh, and, and chasing attention grabbing stocks is not a new thing like this isn't uh, specific to Robinhood investors it was documented by Barbara and Odeen in 2007 where they showed similar effects just not just for, for day traders in general not just for uh, app based uh, commission free day traders and this, this part I found really interesting so the effect of attention on buying behavior was documented as being more prevalent among new investors by uh, C. Scholes and Wu in a 2007 paper. So attention-based buying is prevalent among investors, but more so among new investors. Now, why is that relevant? Using Robinhood data from their, their S1, um, the, the document that they filed before going public, uh, they explained that nearly half and you, you talked about these stats recently too, Cameron, in a, in a past episode. Um, nearly half of their 18 million customers were first-time investors when they signed up. Does not blow so you think, your mind, eh? Those think numbers. about those three, those, those three statements. So day traders tend to trade based on attention. That's like 
uh, recent extreme returns, high or low, uh, stocks that have been in the news, uh, stocks that are you know on on Wall Street bets. Those are all attention grabbing stocks. So uh, investors tend to trade those types of stocks more so among new investors. And if Robinhood is is a good sample for other uh, other institutions like this, uh, then a lot of them, a lot of the users are are new. And th there's another thing that I read about. It was another paper. I didn't end up uh, referencing it in in these notes here, but uh, there's another paper that defined commission-free traders. I think is what they called them as newer investors who are attracted by zero account minimums, uh, no commissions, and fractional shares. So they're really attributing a lot of these traits to these newer, younger investors without a lot of experience or, or a lot of money. Uh, so they find, Barbara and Odin and the co-authors of this paper, they find support in the data for the idea that Robinhood's app design, like I mentioned a minute ago, is impacting the trading decisions of its users. Uh, the, the concentrated buying and selling if the concentrated buying and selling uh, that stems from attention-driven investors resulted in, in good returns, as the internet might lead you to believe, <laughs> uh, then this would be good news uh, for, for investors that, you know, the Robinhood app is, is really helping people make better investment decisions. But in Barbara and Odin's study, they find that the top 0.5% of stocks bought on Robinhood every day lose about 4.7% on average over the subsequent month. So the high attention stocks that Robinhood users are most frequently trading are going on to lose typically after they've been uh, after they've been the most popular stock. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that the Robinhood users are the ones taking those those losses. They could be the ones riding the the herd up to the up to the top of the price and then dumping the stocks before, you know, somebody else eats those eats those losses. So they asked that question too. They said, what if we took the aggregate portfolio of Robinhood investors and see how they do around these herding events? Are, are they timing the herd well? Uh, they found that the Robinhood community loses about 5% during each herding event or 6% if we adjust that for market returns. So their findings suggest that extreme herding causes negative wealth out outcomes for the overall Robinhood community. Hmm. So based on all of that, Keeping in mind that when my last video on day trading came out, everyone's like, well, you, you're, you're not thinking about commission-free trades and apps like Robinhood. Um, based on that paper from Barbara Nodine, the, uh, the, the so-called technological advantage of investors being able to sort of band together through a, an easy-to-use, low-cost app is, is actually making profitable day trading harder rather than easier due to the effects of attention on buying and selling behavior. Is that not what you would have expected, though? Well, it's what I would have expected, but I don't think it's what the average Robinhood user expects. They no, I agree like with you there, but you make it fun, you make it instantaneous, you make it free. How do you expect that to lead to better behavior? Yeah, well, so well, li listen to this next one. So there's another study specific to the impact of trading on, on smartphones, on a mobile app. And I thought this one was even, even more fascinating because it's like, why would that? And they go into some theory of why they think this is true, but I, I didn't touch on that part. I just looked at the empirical portion of uh, of this paper. So this is a 2021 paper by Ankit Kalda and uh, some co-authors titled Smartphone Investing. And it's smart bracket phone investing a within investor time analysis of new technologies and trading behavior. So they got data from two large German retail banks that had recently introduced trading applications for mobile devices. Uh, they had 18,000 bank clients and it let them observe whether trades were placed on a PC or on a smartphone. Uh, they found that the probability of purchasing assets, this is so interesting, the probability of purchasing assets with higher volatility and more positive skewness, those are the lottery-like stocks that we sometimes talk about, like the yep. small cap growth type stocks. Uh, so they've got high probabilities of bad payoffs and low probabilities of really good payoffs. Uh, buying those types of securities increases in smartphone trades compared to non-smartphone trades. So the, the lottery risk seeking behavior seems to increase when people are trading on a smartphone. Uh, and they actually found that people who started trading on their smartphones were more likely to start trading that way on their PC as well. So it's like this experience initiates that risk seeking, <coughs> skewness seeking uh, behavior because it's not even compensated risk we're talking about. 
they found a 67% increase in the probability of buying lottery type stocks for smartphone users. Come on. Uh, yeah. They found that smartphone traders hold more non-diversifying assets, which they, they classify as not mutual funds, but I'm, I'm guessing it means individual stocks and, and other stuff like that. And the smartphone users are more likely to buy attention-grabbing assets. So again, we're back to attention, like past winners and losers. Uh, in, the, in this German bank sample, they found that smartphone trades trail the market by an average of 1% for the 12 months following the trade, while also having a lower sharp ratio on average. So again, we're, we're back at sort of risk-seeking, uh, attention-driven investing but this time it's not based on well it's it's driven it's seemingly by the fact that the trades are happening on a smartphone so i i don't know what exactly the connection is there but it's it is it's a very interesting observation um okay so we've touched on attention uh, and the sort of social aspect of mobile trading or, or or maybe something else that's causing investors to take these risk risk seeking uh behaviors but i, I think the other big one here and there's not really liter academic literature that looks at this being true, what, what I'm about to say, but my, my hunch is that free trades are going to make people more likely to trade, which just makes sense. Like if you're not <laughs> I don't think that's a big leap of logic. Yeah, I don't think it is either. <laughs> there's the, you know, the, the everyone drinks more at an open bar type, uh, type idea. So I, now I said there's no academic literature supporting this. There, there, there was data in a New York Times article showing that uh, in the first quarter of 2020, Robinhood users traded nine times as many shares as E-Trade customers and 40 times as many shares as Charles Schwab customers per dollar in the average customer account. So that, that data does support uh, the free trading at Robinhood uh, resulting in uh, more, more trading. Um, now, why does that matter? Why does more trading matter? <clears throat> well, there's a paper, and again, this is one of the old papers, but I don't see why this one would have changed because it's not based on technology or anything. Uh, Journal of Finance paper by, again, Barbara and Odin, trading is hazardous to your wealth, the common stock investment performance of individual investors. They looked at 66,465 households with account, accounts at a large U.S. discount broker between 1991 and 1996. Uh, they found that individual investors are overconfident and they base that on the empirical evidence that the average household earns a return close to the market before costs, but trails the market by about 1.1% annually after costs. So in other words, they trade to their own detriment, which is something that we would expect overconfident but unskilled traders to do. Uh, the average household in their sample turned over about 75% of its holdings annually and the transaction costs explain their poor, poor performance. The 20% of households in their sample that traded the most often, turning their holdings over more than twice annually, earn net returns that trail the market by 5.5% annually, and they trail a risk-appropriate benchmark by 10.3% annually. So more, more turnover, more transactions leads to worse realized returns, which, I mean, shouldn't be, shouldn't be too surprising for anybody to hear considering that there are costs to transactions. Now, for anyone that's really paying attention, something that I just said... Uh, I, I talked about transaction costs and people might be thinking, you know, well, commissions are free now. So transaction costs are, are different. They're maybe smaller. Um, and it's true in the study that I just mentioned by Barbara and Odin, commissions were the largest contributor to costs with the remainder being the, the bid ask, the bid ask spread. Uh, so with no commissions, good, maybe trading's less, less expensive. So high turnover is less relevant. I don't really think that's, true. Uh, there was a December 2020, the SEC charged Robinhood for misleading customers about their revenue sources and for failing to satisfy their duty of best execution. And without getting into the nitty gritty details of this concept, Robinhood makes money by selling the trades that their customers place to other financial institutions. And the result can be trade execution that's de detrimental to the investor. It can also be trade execution that's better. Uh, but in the case of Robinhood, it was that was found not to be the case. Uh, now this is called payment for order flow. It's uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing, like I just mentioned. But in Robinhood's case, it was determined by Robinhood that between which they were required to do, but between October 2016 and June 2019, for most orders of more than 100 shares, Robinhood customers would be better off trading at another broker dealer, 
because the additional price improvement that such orders would receive at the other broker dealers would likely exceed the approximately five dollars per order commission cost that those broker dealers were charging at the time now keep in mind that was for orders of more than 100 shares if you're trading one share on Robinhood, it's probably the right platform uh, but for for larger orders it wasn't wasn't so good and that's how they're making their their money in canada we don't have payment for order flow it's not currently legal in uh, in canada but well simple trade which is our only free trading option as of now does charge a 1.5 percent current currency conversion fee if you want to trade securities outside of canada uh which i mean if we think about the attention-based trading that we've been talking about <laughs> I think anybody trading on Well Simple Trade is likely to be at least enticed to trade uh, uh, USD a securities. So they're, they're, they're going to make their money somehow, and which should not be surprising. I mean, if you just think about, take, take a different perspective, Robinhood is set to go public uh, this week. Is that right? Yes. Soon. Yes. Uh, well Simple just took a big round of funding. They're both extremely valuable companies. That doesn't happen if you don't have a way to monetize your business. <laughs> so the fact that they're making money and that their customers are, are allowing them to make money shouldn't be a surprise. And th therefore, uh, it, th 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 therefore, nothing nothing's free, even if it does seem to be so by looking at the transactions in your account. So the point of that, somewhat of a, of a digression, was that trading always has a cost. And people said after I released my last video, well, commissions are zero. Okay, fine. Commissions are zero. Trading costs are not zero. The more you trade, the lower your net of cost expected returns are. Uh, okay, the last point I want to touch on, on this on this topic of the f free trading phenomenon of, of 2020 and, and beyond, uh, relates to market efficiency. So this is one of the other things that I heard, that I have heard a lot and continue to hear, uh, is that, this advancement in financial markets has changed the nature of market efficiency. I think market efficiency is, is, is important as a concept, and I think it's an important framework for making investment decisions. So if it is broken, that would be highly relevant to, to me and the way that I think about uh, markets. But I, I do not think that app-based, commission-free, fractional share herding uh, makes markets inefficient or, or, or breaks the hypothesis of efficient markets. Uh, you got to keep in mind when Fama came up with the efficient market hypothesis, all he was really saying was that prices reflect available information. It's a pretty broad statement. I mean, the the, the uh, EMH does does not make a judgment on the on the information that is in prices, just that it it's there. And what information is in prices is a theoretical debate that is not solvable. We can't say whether it's risk or mispricing or preferences that affect that affect prices those are all things that can affect prices um i i mentioned preferences and i think with uh, the meme stock phenomenon uh we we were seeing we were seeing a, a preference to hold that specific stock uh, a preference is like a like a reason unrelated to risk and expected returns for owning that stock and in that case it was you know in, engaging in war with wall street i think was the was the reason for that preference and I, thinking about that I, I i was thinking about this and the thought that came to my mind is that in 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 that way meme stocks are kind of similar to other preferences like environmental considerations and that may make someone like tim nash cringe for me to compare those two things <laughs> tim tim if you're listening i i apologize <laughs> Uh, but if a lot of investors have a preference to own greener companies for reasons unrelated to risk and expected return, uh, that can increase the price of the company, uh, decrease the expected return for the remaining investors, and decrease the cost of capital for the for the business. And that's just that that's what happens if a large group of investors has a preference to hold a type of asset. Now, if if that happens, it's good for the company because their cost of capital goes down. It's good for the realized returns of the investors that were holding the stock before its price went up. And that's one of the things we've talked about in the past that can be confusing about looking at ESG returns. And it's like, oh, wow, the historical returns have been pretty good. But that means expected returns are lower if, if this theory is, is accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, so you end up in the, meme stock case, in the meme stock case, if you didn't ride the wave on the way up, or even if you did, if you're holding it at the top, when the price has gone up a bunch based on the preference of all this, all, all the, the meme stock investors, your expected returns are 
lower. And that's an insight that you get just from looking at the, at the price. Uh, so for making investment decisions, which is why we'd be using the efficient market hypothesis, I don't think that the difference in where the information originates matter a whole lot. Um, I, I don't think you have to make a judgment on how the information got into prices. Prices still contain information that can be used to assess differences in expected returns. Higher prices relative to business fundamentals like book value or, or profits or something uh, mean lower expected returns. Lower prices mean higher expected returns. Pretty simple. Trying to outsmart that by, you know, joining a herd. I, I think that's typically going to be a losing game. Uh, so to wrap all of that up and put a bow on it, uh, free trades have, have not made day trading any easier to profit from. Uh, if anything, I think free trading and the social nature of meme stock culture uh, have, have increased herding behavior. Uh, they've increased the preference for lottery type stocks. They've increased, increased the concentration in attention grabbing stocks. And they've increased the frequency of transactions for the individual investors trading on these what feel like free trading platforms, even if they're not actually free. free. And you wrap all that stuff together and I think it's detrimental to the uh, investment outcomes of the people that are using those platforms for the rest of the market participants. I, I don't think that the hurting behavior of app-based investors is is breaking market efficiency or, or should change the way that we're thinking about anything. Uh, market efficiency just means prices reflect information. Uh, even if that's coming from a group of investors with a preference for owning a certain type of stock, it, it, we can still use the information to gain insight about expected returns. And the GameStop is a good example where the price went up for reasons unrelated to risk and expected return. And if you're a small cap value investor, you would stop holding that stock for that reason, which is an insight that you gained from the price rather than from anything predictive. Amazing. Great info. I thought getting, it was pretty interesting. We're getting a thunderstorm here. So people watching this on YouTube, see I'm looking under my desk. Poor Oscar's freaking out. Oh, it's nice and sunny over here. So yeah, no, it's, it's rolling pretty good here right now. Uh, did you ever watch Johnny Carson? You're probably too young, right? I think nope. he went off the air in the early 90s. Anyways, there was a character in Johnny Carson, so some of the listeners might know. It was Karnak the Magnificent. So he'd hold up these cards and then read the cards. Every time we do this talking sense thing, I think of <laughs> Karnak the Magnificent. Anyways, you ready for your cards from the University of Chicago Financial Education Initiative. What is something you already have that you want to save for the rest of your life. Whew, that's a tough one. I don't really think about stuff like that. Was it was it a thing? Is that what it was? What something. is something you already have that you want to save for the rest of your life? And I guess other than health, of course, and family. Nothing jumps yeah. to my mind. No, no stuff jumped to my mind either. It was family neither was us, the first thing. Neither of us are really stuff kind of people. But family, for sure. Health, for sure. Those are things that I currently have that I hope to keep for ideally as long as I'm... Something we've talked about is like I'm, I, I'm kind of obsessive about family photos. Like I've gone through and taken my parents' slides and digitized them and organized them all. And I think I'm kind of the end of that breed and our family of kids don't really... Like I've got whatever, 25,000 pictures all categorized as you can imagine on my, my Google Drive. I care about that, but I'm not sure if the next generation really cares that much about it. Hmm. But I enjoy them. Question number two, if I could change one money decision I made in the past, it would be? Well, I mean. Certain stocks I wish I had bought. And yeah, I wish, I, <laughs> wish <laughs> I bought some certain stocks. Wish I bought some certain digital currencies. Uh, you know, wish, uh, wish I bought a house in Vancouver a few years back. But it's hard though, because at the time, I mean, we, we get so many ideas like that and I'm, I'm, I'm not equating necessarily all stock to this, but you hear so much, right? You see so many things that don't go well, but there's a couple boy that would have had a meaningful difference. Is that what the question's getting at though? I wonder if there's a better way to, to think about it. Well, money, those are ways that, that that's one, that's one you could have changed your balance sheet, but I mean, I don't regret things that I've done like savings habits or I mean, I'm sure you didn't waste a whole lot of money on stupid stuff. I didn't blow money in casinos or, and if you enjoy that, that's fine. I'm just saying that's just, 
we were both pretty yeah. conservative. Yeah, I can't think of. I I remember when I bought my first car. It was a used car, and this a beauty is such too. a small. This is such a small <laughs> thing. It was the same. You used you used to have the same uh, the same type of vehicle. I remember you telling me that when I got it. But I I was with my dad, and he was all fired up about me getting my first car. So I'm like, all right. So I I buy this used car, and uh, a few years later, maybe it was a good vehicle. But I had to go trade it in, and I ended up looking at the numbers, like from what I paid to what I was able to get for it when I traded in at the dealer, which probably wasn't the best thing to do, but whatever. Uh, the the I would have been better off just I don't know le- leasing probably uh, in that case. So that was one of the reasons that I decided to lease the next time around. I didn't want to take that uh, price because that felt super bad. And then here's another one. <laughs> You're going to think this is ridiculous. And it speaks to, there, there's a paper, I can't remember the name of the paper now. It's a behavioral finance paper that talks about price shopping and how it's detrimental to your, to your oh, happiness. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like one, one of the worst things you can do is price shop. You just make a decision and move on with it. I bought a hose at the Home Depot because I needed, I needed some just ho- like pieces of hose, like two foot pieces of hose to come out of the dehumidifier and, and drain into the floor <laughs> drain and some other random stuff. I, I built a, a mud kitchen for my kids where you cut out holes in a piece of plywood and put metal bowls in there so they can play with the mud. Yeah. And I used the hose with a pump in it so they could have water coming out of their mud kitchen. Anyway, so I need some hose. And I was at Home Depot to get something else. And I bought hose. It's $49 for a 50 foot hose. Uh, ended up being a little bit too small for the female connector that I bought, so I really had to jam it. It was a super annoying experience. I'm at Costco the next day. They've got a 100-foot hose for $32, and it was the right diameter for the female connector that I had at home. And it's just like, I was so frustrated, but I already cut the hose from Home Depot, so they wouldn't take the return. <laughs> the, the, the thing that I found most interesting, though, is that I agonized over this for the whole day. It's such a like a seventeen dollar difference in price, and it, it the hose still worked for what I wanted to do. But I was acutely aware of the fact that I was in agony over this, the silliest thing ever, for almost a while. I was telling myself like, Ben, you're being ridiculous. Why why do you feel upset about this when it's it does it's irrelevant? And I was thinking about the price shopping research, and it was, oh, it was just an interesting experience to to observe how I felt. So take that. The other direction, which is if you don't get, if you don't worry about price shopping, you start to see why Amazon is so appealing. And so many people are saying, you know, you should be buying more local and support local companies. But hose is a good example. My hose burst in the backyard. I just need a new hose. Like, just give me a hose. Go on Amazon. 15 seconds later, another one's ordered and it's here the next day. I ordered it like Saturday night at five o'clock. It was there Sunday morning. Like, it's that crazy. And I, and that may not be great for local businesses, but like, I, I just, don't want to screw around looking for prices of hoses, right? Yeah. Some, someone, I, I can't remember where I saw it. It might have been on Twitter. Somebody said that one of the best things you can do if you don't want to support Amazon is find something that you want to buy on Amazon and then go to the supplier's website and they'll probably be able to send you the same thing and ship it for the same price in the same time frame. So I did that. I needed a uh, hygrometer to measure the humidity. Went on Amazon, found the top rated one, went directly to the retailer site, free shipping. Oh, really? Same, same, same price, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, now with Shop Pay, it's just if if they're on Shopify, it's so oh, easy. Shop Pay is the Shop Pay is the, the slickest best. thing going. <laughs> it's such a good experience. Any other money decisions that you would change? I mean, I'm super proud no, of I, how, I think how my kids handle money. I mean, you're going to learn how to do that with your kids, which is part of these cards, I guess. We, I had a good experience with the kids that we, we went to Toys R Us because uh, my oldest son has been really into Digimon and he wanted a Digimon toy. And I, I give them a, not, not really an allowance because it's not money that's free for them to spend, but I put, uh, I put a dollar amount into each of their bank accounts monthly and they know how much is there and we talk about it. They haven't spent any of it yet, but we went to get a Digimon toy and they didn't have any because Digimon's like, it's old. They don't make much stuff for it anymore. So they didn't have any Digimon toys, but then they're looking at all, all this other stuff. You got the, the Transformers and the Hot Wheels and whatever. Like, oh, look at that, look at that. But uh, he, he agreed that we, we came to get a Digimon toy. They didn't have it, so we should leave. Yeah, all right. Nicely done. So you are starting. 
I guess so. Okay, on to bad advice of the week, and this one comes from a longtime listener, and as he says, a proud owner of two hoodies already. So his name is Max. So Max, thanks for this very much. And uh, he's an advisor, and he wanted to highlight another example of a Canadian big bank's communications, which we talked about in recent bad advice segments. So a recent big bank's communication to clients as they prepare for the client-focused reforms that are happening in Canada. So these are changes that are being made to National Instrument 31103, which is the re- regulatory document from the Canadian Securities Administrators that governs how clients, the relationship between clients and advisors. And the changes are intended to increase the standard of how all advisors operate and require any recommendation that's made by the advisor to the client to be in the client's best interest. So it covers things like know your client, know your product, risk tolerance, And part of the rules is a disclosure of potential conflicts of interest. And this he sent was a screenshot of an example of that disclosure that he got from this bank. So it states that the representative's compensation is such that they, and I'm quoting here, are not influenced to make decisions in clients' account in specific issuers or financial products. So far, so good. However, it continues later in the document to state, you may not invest in any other mutual funds, although you may transfer into your account securities of third-party mutual funds as an accommodation to your wishes. This means that when considering and recommending products that are suitable to you, Big Bank will not consider other proprietary products nor any non-proprietary products or whether those products would be better, worse, or equal in meeting your needs and objectives. If that is an incredible. That is absolutely incredible. A, a lot of it, I get. Like we, we have an approved securities list that we vet and people within our firm are required to use stuff on that list. Like it, you, need to, you need to constrain the opportunity set that advisors can use so that you can make so you can do the due diligence on on products. It's the the yep. whole know your product situation, but to constrain it to products that you have created to your own <laughs> in-house manufactured products. Yeah, that seems like a pretty obvious uh conflict of interest, which is why it's disclosed. But fair enough, I guess. At least they're disclosing it. Anyway, it is what it is. Nothing we can do. Oh, there's that word. I think that was on the bingo card, wasn't it? It is what it is. It, it is what it is. I, I don't know. Oh, that Those bingo card are... that someone made in the community was hilarious. Yeah, bingo cards with stuff that is commonly said <laughs> by us on the podcast. Anyways, that was good. Anything else to add? Uh, no, I think that's good. Uh, the reviews on iTunes, like Cameron mentioned at the beginning, we always appreciate. And I noticed something that we got a... a influx of new reviews like there were six new reviews that came in all at once uh last week and coincident with that our uh ranking in the itunes charts jumped a bunch like we were ranked as high as we've been in, in quite mm-hmm. a while i think we were, we were number seven on the canadian chart for investing Correct. podcasts um so if you're enjoying the podcast uh please review leave us a review which we always read and read on the podcast but i'll just rate it if you don't want to write a review um it it really does seem to help us move up in the chart and the chart makes us more visible to people that are browsing on their podcast app so i think that's i think it's worth doing if if you want to help us grow the the podcast it's going to be interesting when if and when people get back to more uh working in the office because i had read about podcast consumption fell when commuting times fell but i also saw a tweet i don't know if we talked about this last time but our 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 podcast producer matt passy put out a tweet saying that there's more active listeners to podcasts and there are netflix subscribers wow so we'll see what happens this fall yep we'll see what happens all right thank you as always for listening